The story begins as the Abyss threatens to destroy Noelle's hometown. The Abyss is a force that forms when too much mana fills the air and it links the human world with the demon realm called the Void. When the Abyss deepens, more powerful creatures emerge and tonight the Abyss has reached a depth of 12, enough to summon a deadly creature known as a Lord. Noelle's grandfather Brandon, once the strongest seeker and known as the legendary Overdeath, prepares for battle. As the threat looms, he grips his weapon and mutters to himself how he never thought he'd wield it again. Brandon orders Noelle to stay in the shelter, claiming that help will arrive soon. However, Noelle knows his grandfather too well. Help isn't coming. Brandon is preparing to fight the Lord alone, and Noelle realizes that his grandfather plans to defeat it himself. With legendary confidence, Brandon reminds Noelle not to doubt him, asking if he's forgotten who he is. Overdeath, a name feared by all. He promises to protect Noelle with his life, and Noelle calls out to him as he leaves. As Brandon prepares for the fight, he thinks about telling Noelle that men can't let anyone look down on them, no matter when or what they face. Noelle hides in the shelter, terrified as his mind races with thoughts of his grandfather. He stays hidden, feeling dread creep over him as the moments stretch on. Eventually, Noelle steps out of the shelter and finds Brandon gravely wounded. Brandon reflects on his fate, acknowledging that even Overdeath has his limits. He tells Noelle that this is the path of Seekers. Choosing a life of combat means living with death always nearby. Despite his condition, Brandon asks Noel if he still wants to be a seeker, even knowing the dangers that come with it. Noel, holding back his emotions, responds with determination. He tells his grandfather that he will follow the same path and become a seeker. Brandon, though proud, tells Noel that being a seeker is not enough. He must become the strongest, and he asks Noel to promise that he will surpass even him. Noel then swears that he will become the strongest seeker. Brandon chuckles with pride and tells Noel that he loves him. In that moment, Brandon passes away and Noel screams in agony. It's been two years since then and we see that Noel has kept his promise to become a seeker. His team is confronted by monsters, so Noel expertly gives them orders on the best way to win the fight. Noel belongs to the weakest support class called Talkers, but he's proud of it being his job. After defeating the monsters, Noel's team starts cutting them apart. Noel explains that lesser vampires can't use magic, but their queen can reproduce rapidly, creating endless spawns, each strong enough to tear apart an ox. As they strategize, a vampire attacks Noel, but Tanya saves them just in time. The team considers targeting the queen directly to stop the spawns, but Noel advises against it. He explains that their C-ranked team should focus on the spawns first for a higher chance of success. The team knows how critical Noel is to their success, acknowledging that as the buffer of the party, he has the authority to give them orders. Despite their rank, they can take on this B-rank mission because of Noel's direction and skills. Noel then reflects silently on his role. Being a talker means he specializes in support, using his buff words to increase the team's combat abilities. However, his own fighting strength is weak, and he has to rely entirely on his comrades in battle. This is why talkers are often ridiculed as the weakest class. Suddenly, the queen comes out of nowhere, releasing a poisonous gas. The gas spreads quickly, causing chaos. Lloyd and Walter immediately recognize that they must save Noel first because they know that they are powerless without his buffs. Tanya follows as they rush to rescue him. However, in the midst of confusion, Tanya is struck by the monster. Without Noel's buffs, Lloyd and Walter struggle to fight back and they know that they can't win without him. The team begs for Noel to give them orders, and they remind him that he's supposed to be the talker. Anger rises within Noel as he tells everyone not to look down on him. He pulls out his weapon, and he prepares to show his team how a talker fights. Noel uses his talker skill called Tactician. By giving orders to the party, it'll increase the abilities of the members by 25%. Noel tells his brain dead team to avoid an attack and he uses his battle voice, which increases the recovery speed of his team's stamina and mana. Noel has Tanya cast a barrier on the two warriors, and he has them destroy the beast. However, things get worse, as they notice more monsters nearby. Tanya begins to panic, so Noel uses his pure support skill to stabilize her frantic mental state. Noel sets a timer for 74 seconds, and he declares that he will take care of the small fry, so the others can focus on the main body. He continues to instruct the others on every single move they make, 
and he tells them to prepare their most powerful attack. Noel stuns all the small fry and prepares his magic gun, the only anti-beast weapon that a talker like him can rely on. Noel fires an ice bullet to freeze the demons, but one escapes. Noel only has one bullet left, and 43 seconds remain on his timer. Noel determines that the beast will reach him in 23 seconds, so according to his calculations, he has just enough time to tell the guys to attack the main body. He gets the message out just before the beast attacks him, and his brain dead teammates unleash their attack. Tanya is amazed that they were able to win, but she is horrified to find that Noel was struck. This is not the case, however, as Noel's timing was perfect. He dodged just enough to evade the attack, but also factored into his calculations that the spawns would lose their ability to move after the queen was defeated. The battle ends exactly as Noel predicted, with the mission completed in 74 seconds. His teammates, impressed but joking, tease him for being too confident with his risky timing. Noel's thoughts then shift to a memory of his grandfather. As a child, he had been upset about being a talker, and he wished to be a warrior like his grandfather. His grandfather reassured him, promising that his talent would shine and that he would help Noel become the strongest seeker. Back to the present, Noel silently reaffirms his goal to surpass his grandfather, even as a talker, the role most people consider the weakest. Noel then explains how Itre, the capital of the Velnant Empire, thrives on magic and technology derived from research on the beasts. The city depends on seekers to protect it from the abyss, and they are admired as heroes. Later, while the team enjoys a meal, Noel reflects on how at 15 years old, he began searching for companions in Itre, knowing that as a talker he couldn't fight alone. Walter, proud of their $5,000 reward, talks about their progress, while Tanya and Lloyd discuss aiming higher. Noel, however, quietly thinks that they could benefit from having a scout, but for now he focuses on gaining experience with his current team. The conversation changes when Walter asks Noel if he's upset about the reward. Walter is drunk, so he teases Noel for caring too much about money, saying a seeker should be big hearted. Walter's words about money trigger a memory for Noel, reminding him of something his grandfather had once told him. His grandfather explained that seekers must prioritize money to buy the best equipment and supplies for survival. Being labeled as greedy or evil is a mark of success, not shame. His grandfather, known as Overdeath, taught Noel never to let others look down on him, regardless of their opinions. Returning to the present, Noel insists he isn't upset, but Walter continues to criticize him. This escalates into a back and forth exchange, with Noel mocking Walter's reliance on age for authority. Ability is all that matters for a seeker, so Noel mocks Walter for using his age to force others to agree with him. The furious Walter accuses Noel of staying safe in battle while others take the risk. Walter reminds him that he puts his own life at risk to tank for the others, but Noel continues to taunt him. Their argument intensifies as Walter says that he will end Noel's life, and Noel accepts his challenge. Lloyd steps in to break it up, and he reminds them that they are all comrades. He suggests that they split the reward and call it a night, successfully calming the tension between them. After completing the mission, the team is left with only $2,500 each after paying the clan. Tanya is disappointed with the payout, feeling that it was too small for the effort involved. Lloyd explains that while the mission was tough, missions like these are rare and they'll make more money when they take on another job. However, Noel points out that unlike official clans, they don't receive missions directly from the country, which limits their opportunities and earnings. He mentions how rare missions like these are is for independent seekers like them and how much more difficult it is without being part of a clan. Lloyd updates the group on their total savings, which amounts to just over $100,000. Without hesitation, Noel proposes using that money to establish their own clan. Lloyd warns Noel that starting a clan requires paying the country $200,000, far more than they currently have. Noel responds confidently, stating that he's willing to cover the remaining $80,000 from his own savings. His determination is clear. He believes that establishing a clan will allow them to break free from doing secondhand jobs and truly grow. Despite Lloyd's warnings about the high costs of renting a base of operations in the capital, Noel remains undeterred, explaining that he already has a lead on a cheap place. Lloyd expresses doubts about their ability to manage a clan, pointing out that they are still a young and experienced C-ranked team. He feels that they aren't ready for such a responsibility. Noel challenges this thinking, asking Lloyd when exactly they will be ready. 
He argues that if they don't take action now, they'll remain stuck as C rank seekers forever. He insists that experience will come from running a clan, not from waiting until they feel ready. Lloyd continues to express concern, stating that without the country's trust, they won't receive the high paying jobs they need to succeed. Noel counters this by explaining that their youth attractiveness and strength are assets the country values. The government wants more seekers, and a successful seeker is often seen as both an idol and a hero. He believes that their look and skills will help them succeed, and he even brings up how signing contracts with companies could bring them sponsorships and additional income. Walter, still shocked by the conversation, can't believe that being good looking could help them get better treatment from the country, but Noel remains confident. He even tells Walter that despite his flaws, he too has the kind of looks that could benefit the clan's image. Walter, who was initially skeptical, is eventually swayed by Noel's argument. Tired of doing secondhand jobs, he agrees with the idea of forming a clan, adding that status, fame, and money are all appealing. He even makes a crude joke about using his newfound status to attract women, which causes Tanya to scold him. With Walter on board, Noel turns to Lloyd, asking for his opinion as the leader. Noel's determination shocks everyone when he reveals that if they don't agree to form a clan, he's prepared to quit the party and take his share of their savings. He reminds them that he has a dream to become the greatest seeker, surpassing even his grandfather, the legendary Overdeath. Lloyd is taken aback by Noel's conviction, but he understands that this is something Noel isn't willing to compromise on. After thinking it over, Lloyd agrees. His reason is that they would have to make this decision sooner or later. Tanya, still in disbelief, questions Lloyd's choice, but he reassures her that this was always the path they were headed towards. Lloyd recommends that they continue discussing the details later after resting and recovering from the long day and all the alcohol. The group agrees to reconvene in two days to finalize their plans. As everyone leaves, Tanya stops Noel, but she just ends up saying goodbye. The next day, Walter frantically tells Noel that Lloyd and Tanya have betrayed them, leaving them shaken and uncertain about what to do next. According to the note, Lloyd yoloed all his money into some meme coins and fell deep into debt. In order to pay it off, he used all the party's money, so he and Tanya left before anyone could find out. Noel laughs like a lunatic, so Walter reminds him that they were just betrayed. Noel doesn't really care because he's enjoying the fact that the mighty Lloyd has fallen. He looks like a complete fool, so Noel tells Walter to laugh with him. Walter explains that he got the lead on a good job, so he wanted to tell the party before anyone beat them to it. However, when he went to tell Lloyd, he found that his place was emptied out and he found the letter. The owner of the inn told him that Lloyd left the night before, so Noel determines that they must have managed to just slip out of the city before the gates were closed. Walter found the note sooner than Lloyd was planning, so that buys Noel time to find them. He determines that the traders are likely on foot because renting a horse would leave a paper trail, so they should be able to catch up to them. Walter is really eager to go, so he rushes Noel. He wants to punch Lloyd right in his dumb looking face because that's all that will quell his anger. Noel mocks him for thinking that everything will be okay after he punches Lloyd, but Noel explains that there's no coming back from this kind of betrayal. Noel declares that it's not a matter of catching them and talking it out. In the worst case scenario, Noel is ready to fight them to the death. Walter is shocked, but Noel just wants him to make sure that he can defeat Lloyd in a fight. Walter is sure that he can with Noel's support, but he is startled when he realizes that he will have to fight Tanya as well. Noel explains that Lloyd must have figured that they wouldn't come after them because they wouldn't be able to get their money back anyway. Walter wonders if this means that they will just have to give up, but Noel says that it's quite the opposite. Noel has a motto, and that is to repay friend and foe alike a thousand times over. Noel has Walter gear up, and Walter wonders why they have come to the Orc Club. Noel doesn't answer, and instead tells Walter that he's a complete idiot, but he's also an excellent warrior. His point is that they both have their areas of expertise, so Walter needs to leave the thinking to him. Inside, Walter is shocked when Noel announces to everyone that his party has been betrayed. He declares that he wants the traitors to be found and captured, so he puts up a reward of $20,000. Walter wonders why Noel had to tell everyone, so Noel explains that it's all part of his plan. One group is willing to accept the offer, and Noel assures them that he will pay up if they are successful. 
Noel gives them the details, and the furry and his party rush off to find the traitors. The club clears out as everyone rushes to do the job, and Noel begins to wonder if he was wrong about something. Just then, a guy asks to speak with Noel, and Noel determines that his plan worked. It turns out that this guy saw Lloyd and Tanya when he was on his way back from a job. Walter demands to know where they are, but the bum refuses to talk without some money first. Noel only offers to give him half of the reward because the guy clearly is incapable of taking out the traders on his own. The guy tries to negotiate for more money, but Noel doesn't budge at all and even threatens to just walk away. Noel has analyzed this guy already and he can tell that he's in no position to turn down cash. The guy tells them where the traders are headed, so Noel instructs Walter to wait at the gate with the guy and his party. Noel has other business to take care of first, but he doesn't tell Walter what it is. A while later, Noel is ready to go and Walter wonders if Noel can really defeat Lloyd and Tanya. Without hesitation, Noel says he can and he doesn't plan on showing any mercy either. This even means ending their lives. Surprisingly, Noel explains that he thinks of everything and he even had a contingency plan in case he was ever betrayed by an ally. Walter is shocked to realize that this means Noel never trusted them even though they were close friends. Noel explains that trusting someone doesn't mean having blind faith in them and being critical of who you trust is the basics of building any party. Walter is ready to go, but Noel can tell that he's too soft. Walter isn't as committed as he is making it seem, and Noel predicts that what is about to happen will be very painful for him. Elsewhere, we see the traitors. Lloyd assures Tanya that Noel won't come after them because he knows that there's no way to get the money back. They are of course shocked however when Noel appears behind them. The others come out of hiding and Noel uses his talking power to stop the traitors from moving. Noel declares that that attack is called the stun howl and Lloyd was being too careless. Walter angrily demands for answers but Noel calms him down and calmly asks his own questions. This leads him to his own conclusions and Lloyd is shocked when Noel determines that his investment story was a lie. In reality, Lloyd has been gambling. He lost big and fell into debt with some sketchy people. Lloyd begins to apologize as the truth is finally out, but Walter loses his mind and he reminds Lloyd that they risked their lives countless times for that money. The gambling addict bites back and points out that none of them have any idea how hard it is to be the leader. They all push the burden of leadership onto him, but they also want all the privileges when it suits them. Lloyd continues defending himself, but Noel shuts his face up. He points out that Lloyd was the one that wanted to be the leader in the first place, so he can't complain about how hard it is. Noel makes him pay for his mistakes, and Lloyd begs him to stop. Everyone is horrified, as Noel just continues beating him down, and he declares that Lloyd can apologize after he has taken another thousand kicks. Tanya begs him to stop, but she is horrified when Noel wonders if she wants to be kicked instead. Noel doesn't discriminate against women, and he won't hold back when he punishes her either. Noel doesn't want to hear any of her excuses, so he just uses his talking ability to get her to confess about gambling with Lloyd. She admits to dipping into the party's funds as well, but she blames everything on Lloyd. She is a serious gambling addict as well, so she says that they could have won it big if Lloyd just let her gamble more. Noelle's talker skill called Confess forces a person to tell the truth and Tanya is furious when he releases her mind. She points out that it's illegal to use mind control skills for personal gain and Noelle could go to jail for it. Noelle agrees that this is normally the case, but Lloyd and Tanya are criminals who embezzled party funds. Imperial law allows the use of mind control skills if it's to make criminals admit to their crimes. Noel is absolutely terrifying and he tells Tanya that they will be the only ones going to jail. Embezzlement is punishable by 10 years of hard labor, so Noel congratulates them on throwing their lives away. The guy from earlier is ready to get paid, but he gets antsy when Noel tells him to wait. Noel tosses him to the ground as he refuses to allow filth to touch him and he tells the loser to sit and wait. The guy doesn't take the insults lightly, so Noel just silences him with a punch to the chest. A look back shows that old grandpa taught Noel to punch people right in their hearts in order to temporarily paralyze them. This attack allows even weak people to put on the strongest of fighters. Unlike other classes, talkers have no way to buff themselves, so grandpa taught Noel this move so that he can defend himself. 
Just then, the person Noel has been waiting for finally arrives, and everyone is shocked to see that it's the slave trader named Finocchio. The biggest mafia group in the capital is the Luciano family, and Finocchio is the boss of one of their subfamilies. This guy is cheery, but he can also be horrifyingly cruel. He is the very definition of a two-face. Because of this, the people call him the Mad Clown. Walter realizes that this meeting is the business Noel was taking care of before leaving. Noel knew that Tanya and Lloyd wouldn't have a single penny left of their party's funds, so he made a deal with Finocchio to recoup the lost money. That is when Noel decided that he would sell Lloyd and Tanya as slaves. Tanya refuses to agree to this, so Noel offers to hand them over to the military police instead. Noel is really evil as he gives some statistics. The survival rate for prisoners sent to work in the mines for 10 years is only a measly 2%. Noel suggests that they just agree to be slaves because at least they might be able to luck out with a kind master. Finocchio does his appraisal, but he only offers to pay 60000 for the pair. Finocchio explains that he usually pays more, but there's something happening at the capital. A certain church is about to issue an ordinance which will force the rich to have to cut back on luxuries. Spending too much on slaves would get the church's attention, but Noel is disappointed to see that even the mafia can't defy the church. Finocchi is glad when Noel agrees to sell the traders, but he is horrified when Noel says that he will only sell them for $110,000. Finocchi complains, so Noel instantly raises the price to $120,000. More complaining only gets it raised to $150,000, and Finocchi's true colors begin to show. His voice deepens, and he threatens to slice Noel open, so he can feed his innards to the pigs. Noel is a genius though, and says that if Finocchi pays $150,000 for them, he will tell everyone that Finocchi actually bought them for $300,000. Lying about the sale price like this will increase their value, and Finocchi will be able to sell them for a huge profit. Lloyd and Tanya are young and beautiful, so Noel is sure that the rich will be willing to pay at least $900,000 for them. Finocchi only needs to pay Noel $150,000 and Finocchi will be able to keep the rest. Finocchi warns that they will both be in danger if this little scheme is found out, but Noel points out that Finocchi deals in risky business for a living. Finocchi always knew that Noel was a smart guy, but he had no idea that he was this crazy. He asks Noel to join his family and even offers to give him a leadership role. Noel rejects the offer, but Finocchi does agree to pay him $150,000 for the traders. Finocchi doesn't want word of this getting out, so he makes a terrifying threat to the poor guy. Finocchi makes the upfront payment to Noel, but Tanya begs for mercy. She reminds Noel that they are friends, but he just calls her a traitor and says goodbye. Tanya turns to Walter for help next, and she reminds him that he's supposed to be in love with her. Tanya loses her mind, and she insults Walter for being a coward as she is taken away. With that business over with, Noel pays the poor guy his 10000 the guy tries to insult Noel for being such a jerk, but Noel tells him to do a better job of keeping his emotions in check. The guy just calls Noel the devil, but this doesn't bother Noel. Instead, he plans to use that notoriety to forge himself into the strongest in the world. Later, Noel arrives at the gate to say goodbye to Walter. They had a talk earlier because Walter was thinking about quitting as a seeker. Noel assured Walter that while he is the dumbest person he has ever met, he is also a great warrior. He's the best he knows, so he wanted the two of them to rebuild their party from the ground up. Noel needed him, but Walter ultimately decided to quit being a seeker altogether. Noel leaves Walter with a parting gift, and Walter can't figure out if Noel has a heart or not. He wonders if Noel knew that he was actually the one Tanya loved, but he knows that Noel isn't in search of love. Noel only cares about strength, and strength alone. Walter thinks about how happy their party used to be, and he dramatically says goodbye to the best party member he has ever known. Afterwards, Noel thinks about how he has to start from square one now. He spots some snakeskin nearby, and his composure changes again. He says that snakes shed their old skins in order to grow new and stronger scales. Noel will have to do the same, so starting today, the Blue Beyond party will be born anew. A while later, Noel begins his search for a new party that he hopefully won't have to sell. Wolf bugs our hero as he points out that talkers can't fight alone, so he wants Noel to join his party. Wolf's party is called Lightning Bite, and they have a lot of potential as a C-rank Ricky party. 
Leisha tells Wolf to stop bothering the talker because Noelle will just reject him like every girl has for his entire life. Noel surprisingly agrees to join on one condition, so Wolf compliments himself for being a great negotiator. Unfortunately for this furry, Noel will only join if he is allowed to be the leader. Wolf's team doesn't mind at all, and they point out that Noel is way smarter than Wolf. Wolf kind of agrees, but he doesn't want to give up control of the party that he started. Just then, everyone is shocked when a girl sneaks up on them. Her name is Alma, and she saw a bulletin Noel posted about his search for new party members. Noel explains that minors can't be seekers, but Alma says she's a full-grown 21-year-old adult. That's even 5 years older than Noel. The Lightning Bite members ask her some questions, and she rattles off answers with ease. Noel actually has some serious questions, and he learns that Alma is a C-rank scout. Noel thinks she might be pretty valuable because scouts can detect danger when exploring abysses. Noel wants to know why she wants to be a seeker, but Alma reveals that she doesn't want to be a seeker at all. Surprisingly, she is only interested in Noel, the grandson of Overdeath. Alma doesn't actually know Overdeath, but her grandfather fought him once and lost his arm. Noel assumes that she has come for revenge, but she actually just came to see what kind of seeker Noel is. Noel apologizes on his grandfather's behalf for removing one of her grandfather's limbs, but Alma says it's not necessary. Alma reveals that her grandfather's name is Alcor, and this name sends chills down the spines of everyone in the bar. This is because there is a secret society called the Society of Assassins. They will take out anyone for the right price. Alcor is its leader, and he is a legendary assassin. Some guy accuses Alma of lying, and he tells Wolf that she is in the wrong bar. Seeker bars have unwritten rules that say you have to be a certain rank to enter. He says that rookies like Alma are not allowed in this bar, and it's a custom to beat up rule breakers. Noel explains how Seekers are ranked, so Alma determines that she just has to beat up the big ape to show that she belongs. The others worry about her saying such bold things to the big strong guy, but Noel seems very confident in this girl's abilities. The big guy named Logan tries to attack her, but Alma quickly turns the tables and wrecks the guy. Everyone is stunned, so Noel doesn't waste any time, and he hires her to join his party. Alma is hungry, so Noel gets her a fried bun to snack on, and he is glad to see that she really is the granddaughter of Alcor. Noel had his doubts because she was claiming to be related to a legendary assassin, but she definitely proved herself. On the other hand, Alma never doubted that Noel is over Death's grandson because his eyes say that he would do anything to win. Alcor passed away recently, and he always warned Alma to never fight over Death. Alma has been training in the mountains to become an assassin. She hasn't leveled up to B rank yet, but she says that she already meets the conditions. Alma tried joining the Society of Assassins, but something went wrong. A look back shows that she was disappointed to see that some weak looking guy was her exam opponent. The guy was insulted, and he was determined to show her what a real assassin could do. The guy stood no chance as Alma just toyed with him, and he begged for the exam to be stopped. Alma declared that Alko always told her that only the strong survive in the Society of Assassins, and the weak are sacrificed to the god of the underworld. The guy tried to tell her that that stuff was outdated and the society is no longer run that way, but Alma didn't care, and she ruthlessly tried to end his life. Alma was stopped by the new head of the society named Sion, and Alma was never let in. They approved of her skill, but they told her that she wasn't a good fit. They had no need for old style assassins, as they were heading in a different direction. The society used to be an underground group, but they are planning to affiliate soon with the crown. Noel is shocked because this means that there will be a legitimate organization. They will mainly be doing espionage instead of eliminating people through contracts. Alma remembers that this was supposed to be a secret, so Noel wonders if the society will send assassins to silence him. Alma says that she will act as his big sister to protect him, but Noel quickly shuts down the idea of her being his sister. As the two journey, Noel explains that there are several types of buffs that buffers use. For example, there's the talker skill called Assault Command. It's powerful enough to end a fight in one shot, but it will backfire badly if it's used at the wrong time. This is why buffers must be very aware of everything that's going on on the battlefield. 
A buffer's real job is to control the flow of the battle. Buffers can't buff themselves, however, and they're really not meant to fight at all. Alma knows that Noel is different though, and he agrees that it's the only reason he has been able to survive for this long. The two reach their destination, and Noel tells Alma that he wants her to capture a monster. He wants to test her by having her capture a killer bunny after he buffs her. Alma says that she doesn't need his buff, but that isn't his goal. It's common to think that the buff will just make things easier, but using buff skills is not easy. As a comparison, Noel points out how scouts have a skill called Excel that doubles their speed, and it can be stacked up to 5 times. Alma had to practice this skill relentlessly, otherwise using it would have caused her to get severely injured. Noel explains that the same goes for buffs. To make the best use of them, a person must first train to adapt to them. Noel's little experiment will test Alma's adaptability, and the results will determine what they do moving forward. Noel warns that his old teammates were very talented, but even they needed months to adapt to his buffs. Alma is not concerned, however, and she assures him that she will do just fine. After Alma determines how many bunnies are in the area, Noel buffs her with battle voice and tactician, and he starts the test. Alma is amazed by the power she feels surging through her, and Noel explains that all her stats will be boosted as long as she follows his instructions. Alma needs to capture at least one rabbit in 10 seconds to pass, so he orders her to do so. Alma immediately stacks her Excel skill 5 times and she instantly captures a rabbit. She is amazed by how light she feels and couldn't be more impressed to see what a talker can do. Noel doesn't even make it past 8 seconds and Alma instantly returns after capturing every single rabbit in the area. Noel can't believe that she got them all because this was her first time using his buff. Noel is jealous of her inborn talent and he decides that she won't even need training. They are even ready for their first job, and Alma is excited to explore the abyss because she has never been before. Noel reveals that he already accepted a job from a village that is having trouble with some thieves. This is when Noel declares that the new Blue Beyond's first job will be to hunt bandits. Moments later, Alma enjoys her first ride on a carriage. Noel says that there is a long trip ahead of them, so he will tell her about Seeker's work. Seekers take a wide variety of jobs. There are crime hunts for tracking down criminals, monster hunts for capturing monsters, and treasure hunts where they search for valuable items. They are about to do a job for poor villagers, so Noel doesn't expect much of a reward, but it's more to test Alma's abilities. Alma is eager to prove herself, and Noel remembers the good old days. When they reach the halfway point to the village, Alma has some aches from sitting too long, so she hates carriages now. Unfortunately for them, most inns are filled, so it takes a while for them to find a place to stay. Alma innocently says that they can share a bed, but Noel really doesn't think that's a good idea. After Noel finishes up his shower, Alma's amazed to see how fit he is. She compares him to an untamed beast, but she thinks that it's a shame. No matter how hard Noel trains, he will never be able to catch up to inborn talent. If Noel was a warrior like Overdeath, he could have been the ultimate seeker. Noel instructs her to close her eyes and he gives her a smack on the head for the unnecessary comments. He sends her off to take a bath while he goes to sleep, but he can't stop thinking about what she said. He knows better than anyone that he can never catch up to inborn talent. Overdeath, however, was sure that Noel had latent talent within himself and he was determined to make Noel into the greatest seeker. Noel holds those words close to his heart and he wishes his grandfather was still around. A while later, the new Blue Beyond group arrives at the village. The village chief is shocked when Noel explains that his old teammates betrayed him, so he sold them. The chief's daughter is too shy to come say hello because she's a fan of Blue Beyond. Noel assumes that she's disappointed that their old leader isn't there, but the girl actually likes Noel. Noel then discusses the job. There are around 20 thieves, and they have already invaded some neighboring villages. They don't just take money and goods either, they have been taking young girls. The chief explains where the thieves are hiding, and Noel says that's all he needs to know. The chief gives Noel the upfront payment of $20,000, and the randomness of the coins makes Noel realize that they worked really hard to scrape together the payment. The chief promises to give him the remaining $30,000 after the job is done, so Noel goes to do it. On the way, Alma points out that the bald creep was staring at her chest and the chief's daughter catches up to the pair. 
She cheers for their success and shows Noel a device that he taught her to make when he last came to the village. The girl is a huge fan of his and she runs off while promising to have her mother make them a meal. Alma teases Noel about the girl being in love with him but he gets her back by saying that she has all her mass in her chest and not enough in her brain. When they arrive at the thieves hideout, Noel wonders why the chief said that there were only 20 of them. There's at least double that and there's no way that a simple drifter could gather a group this large. Noel then recognizes their leader who is called Gordo the Razorblade. There is a bounty on his head for $200,000 and he is a B rank. Alma is sure that she can beat him one on one but things could get ugly if all the thieves jump in. Alma is shocked when Noel says that he can take care of the rest and he reveals his plan. Moments later Alma conceals herself and Noel uses his thought sharing skill so they can communicate. Alma sets herself up outside the leader's tent and says that she's ready when Noel is. Noel uses Stun Howl to stun the thieves and then he uses his command powers to order Alma to eliminate Gordo. Alma uses her Excel ability to its max and she instantly plunges her blade right through the chest of Gordo. Noel then quickly issues his next order which is for Alma to keep the enemies distracted until he joins the fight and he begins his timer. Alma does a tad bit more than distracting the thieves and Noel calls her a moron for having so much fun eliminating the enemies. Noel correctly predicts that she will get herself in trouble but he uses a flash grenade to blind the enemies and some flame bullets to cover them in flames. Afterwards Noel casually shows Gordo's head to the chief and demands for his reward but the chief wants him to have dinner first. The chief daughter explains that she wants to be a seeker just like Noel so he explains all the steps required to achieve her dream. She's disappointed to hear that she will have to save up a lot of money for the registration but Noel explains that she can work as an apprentice to build up experience. Apprentices do odd jobs for seekers and she can even get paid if she joins the apprentice association. As they speak the chief looks towards his tired wife in a suspicious way. The girl eagerly hopes to join Blue Beyond one day and Noel looks forward to fighting alongside her. The girl has never been more motivated as she promises to train hard but they're interrupted when the chief arrives with an expensive bottle of wine. He was saving it for a special occasion and the moment is now as his daughter Chelsea is about to enter the next chapter of her life. Noel is clearly the smartest person ever as he senses that something is wrong and he tells the chief that it would be rude if he drank first. Noel insists that the chief taste the wine before him but the chief is hesitant. He really begins to freak out as Noel becomes very serious and Noel reveals that he knows that the wine has been poisoned. The chief tries to deny it of course but Noel knows that he was trying to kill them so he wouldn't have to pay up what he owed Noel. Noel then predicts that he was also planning to sell all their goods for twice the profit. The chief continues to deny it and says that Noel has no proof. Noel really breaks things down as he points out that a man cheap enough to lie about how hard the job was would not spend $10,000 on wine. Secondly, the wine is actually really cheap and Noel was able to tell from its scent that it was opened a while ago. Noel's third point of evidence is that he was able to sense hostility from the chief the second he brought out the wine. Alma calls the chief an idiot since his plan wouldn't have worked anyway because scouts like her are resistant to poison. The chief is insulted by the accusations so Noel tells him to drink the wine to prove his innocence. The chief loses his cool and just demands that they leave his village so Noel calms him down by controlling his brain with his confessed skill. Chelsea is horrified when the chief is forced to admit to everything and Noel absolutely destroys his eyeball. Noel really doesn't like being betrayed so he says that he won't just stop at one eye. He plans to take the chief's ears and even his tongue so the chief begs for forgiveness. Noel refuses to listen so the chief promises to get him his money. This does nothing to calm Noel so the chief tries to explain that he's in debt. Noel is done negotiating as he prepares to remove the next eye but the chief reveals that he's in debt to the Gambino family and they will end his life if he misses a payment. Noel again couldn't care less but Chelsea appears with every dime her family has and she begs Noel to stop hurting her father. It's $80,000 so the chief calls his daughter stupid because the Gambinos will do much worse things to him if he doesn't pay them. Chelsea begs Noel to take the money so he decides that it will be enough. However, as he leaves, Chelsea declares that she now hates seekers. 
A while later, Alma wonders if Noel feels bad for disappointing someone that looked up to him. Noel is the most cold-blooded dude ever, as he says that if he was afraid of disappointing people, he would just go live on a deserted island. Alma offers to give him a hug if he wants to cry, but Noel just tells the brainless girl to go hug a cactus. Just then, the two see an airship that belongs to a three-star regalia clan called Goat Dinner. The regalia rank is only granted by the emperor when he recognizes a clan's ability. Only seven clans can have regalia at one time, but they aren't all equal. They are ranked by strength and accomplishment. There are four three-star clans, two two-star clans, and only one one-star clan. Airships like the one they just saw are a privilege that regalia clans get, and every seeker in these clans are world class. Noel then shocks Alma as he declares that in just one year's time, they will have a regalia. A look into the past shows that Alma admitted to killing her own father, Alcor. She explained that Alcor, known as the god of killing, couldn't fight when his mind was gone. Greg wasn't surprised by her confession because Alcor was a terrifying man. He sought power for power's sake and he became the harbinger of death. He had absolute power, but there was still one man he couldn't beat and that was over death. After realizing this, Alcor had a long-term mental breakdown. Greg then revealed that he knew Alma's secret. She isn't Alcor's granddaughter, she is his daughter. Alcor had many children with women he would abduct from villages. He had his children battle each other to find which one was closest to him in power. He could never escape the fear of defeat, so he decided to make a new him that would never lose. All his kids lost their lives for this dream of his, and his biggest success was Alma, as she was the one left standing. Alma was upset when Greg refused to let her join the secret society despite her incredible power, so Greg revealed a secret to her. They would not stop taking lives when they became an official government organization, but their reasons for doing so would change. Alma couldn't believe that she was being treated this way after 20 years of forced training, but Greg simply said that she would be a danger to the society. Alma pointed out that she never had any friends or any relationships at all, and she demanded that she be given her life back. Alma was completely lost, so Greg told her that she can now live her life however she wants. He revealed that Overdeath has a grandson, and he is a powerful seeker. Back to the present, Alma couldn't be happier, as she has a purpose in life now, and she promises to always fight alongside Noel. Thanks for watching my recap. Subscribe to the channel for more videos.